I had the problem when I first came home from Iraq with PTSD. I was self-medicating on a constant basis, constantly drinking alcohol. I was very distant from my children and my wife at the time. Uh, you just blow up at the smallest things. You can't, you can't control your anger. One time, my daughter wanted chocolate on her ice cream, and she was crying because she wanted chocolate on her ice cream. And I got upset, and I just threw the whole bowl of ice cream across the room into the wall. It's all over, I think, with me, was a feeling of guilt for what I had done in Iraq, what I had, had dealt with going to war and realizing that I was just being used. There's nothing patriotic about what I was doing over there. The only thing I was doing in Iraq was trying to survive and make it home. Some startling and disturbing new video has just come into the Situation Room. We are learning more about a controversial video released by the left-wing website WikiLeaks. It's come to uh, show a military assault in Iraq three years ago that resulted in the death of a journalist and his drug. And now a classified video of the attack is being watched by millions around the world. The Pentagon the has confirmed the video is authentic but says proper military procedures were followed. There was an investigation of this incident. The Army found no one at fault. For details of the investigation, obviously I would point you over to the Department of Defense. If, if you're hanging around with bad guys who are shooting at our troops, it's anything but murder. You're, you're part of it at that point. Moments later, a van arrives to help the wounded. This district was New Baghdad called Nainisan, just south of Sadr City. It's the hottest of the hot zone. We have individuals going to the scene. Looks like possibly uh, picking up bodies and weapons. It's where we're finding RPG 29s, armored piercing RPGs. Come on, let's shoot. Another hail of gunfire. At least eight people are dead. Two children are hit. I got a wounded girl. We just take her off the mile. From your perspective, were the rules of engagement followed from what you see in this piece of video? Let me let me be clear. Based on what I've seen only, and I'm making it on what I've seen. No, they were not. Were the soldiers justified in the use of deadly force? Yeah, absolutely. The Their job were not there is shooting to make at our troops. None of those insurgents. And this video is traveling around the world, and people are just getting uh, horrified by it. Our military will take every precaution necessary to ensure the safety and security of civilians. Come on, buddy. I got to just pick up a weapon. You know, war is a terrible business. There are mechanisms that, that uh, people use. The language uh, is probably fairly blunt. Oh, yeah, look at those dead bastards. Nice. They were anticipating more fire, and they reacted. And right. they followed the rules of engagement. They reacted terribly, and they killed right. a lot of civilians. Thank you both which so is much awful. for being here. It was a fair and, and balanced debate, uh, as promised, and we appreciate both of your perspectives. Folks, we're still taking your emails on it, which are coming in fast and furiously. It's Kelly at FoxNews.com.
coming. They're coming. They're gonna go on their own. Timmy! Is this bread? Good, because we need too much bread. My name is Ethan McCord. I live in Wichita, Kansas. Daddy, I have camel. I know, son. I left the Army in uh, July 2009. You know, I'd, I'd been living with what happened that day as well as many other days in Iraq um, since I came home. And um, I was actually starting to get a little bit better. I could sleep better at night. Don't forget to grab your bread. I wasn't thinking about Iraq as much. More worried about my children and the life of being an almost single father. I dropped my children off to school on, what is it, April 5th. Came home, grabbed a cup of coffee, sat down on the couch and turned on the news like I do every morning. And the first image I saw on the news was me running across the screen carrying a child. I knew it was me immediately because that whole image is burned into my head. The whole day is just, it's there. It's always in the, been in the back of my head. You know, the smells came back to me of that day, the, uh, the images. All right, we got about uh, eight individuals. The cries of, of the, chi the child came back to me. I, f I, was, I was really angry because I tried to put this behind me and not, and not think about it. My uncle served in Vietnam in the Marine Corps. My brother is in the Air Force. But I always wanted to join the military ever since I was a kid. I just thought it was, you know, the whole glorified, glamorized, being a soldier type of thing. I decided to join the infantry even though a lot of people were telling me not to. I felt that if I was going to go Army, I was going to go Army all the way. You know, but you have no idea. I was a little bit older than most recruits. 25 years old. It was a brand new unit standing up, 216. I think this is the bumpiest fucking road in Iraq. And so. Freestyle rap about Iraq. Okay. Ready, go. Yo, 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 we in Iraq, we getting stupid, getting crazy. So it was a majority of brand new privates who were just coming out of basic training. 18, 19 year old kids. So yeah, it took a year and a half of training to get these, these soldiers ready to, for combat. I had it in my head that we're in Iraq for a good cause. We're there to help the Iraqi people. This is our mission is to, you know, provide stability for the Iraqi people. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be the guy that the Iraqis were cheering for as you're driving down the road. Battery power, we're back. I think you got the whole rundown on the uh, military forces here. Oh, Damn. shit! My first two weeks I was there, I was hit by an IED. I was driving the vehicle and it hit my door and uh, knocked me out. When I came to, the first thing I did is, is I was feeling for my arms and legs, making sure that they're there. And, and uh, it was pretty horrifying. There was a lot more combat for me. We were involved in many altercations, skirmishes. There weren't like any groups of men who would run up and attack us and stay there and fight us. People would take pop shots at us or the sniper would shoot at you. You couldn't see him or it was an IED, I got blown up a few more times after that. A good friend of mine, um, great, great kid, great person, um, Andre Craig, uh, he was killed in an IED um, that uh, it took off his arm and crushed his jaw into his, uh, into his throat. And he had a little girl. I felt that I needed to um, honor him in some way. And so I, th I thought, what, what better way to honor somebody than by putting their name forever on your skin? So 
I put the dog tags draped over my elbow in remembrance of them. And to just lose somebody who, you know, who you trained with for so long, who you felt was a brother of yours. And it's, it's a hard thing to deal with. And especially when you're in that situation on a daily basis, you, you, your anger just builds up in you to a point where you, you just don't care. You, now, all, now all you care about is surviving and getting home. We left the FOB, the forward operating base, at about 4 a.m. We were told that we were gonna be going out to do a cordon and search and knock and search. You go in and you search their houses. Um, look for anything from bomb making materials to militia paperwork. This location, and there's more that keep walking by, and one of them has a weapon. Roger received our Nothing really happened for the majority of the day. We, it was pretty boring. You know, we were out there joking around and playing with the animals and stuff like that in between searching houses because there was nothing going on. Hotel 26 is Crazy Horse 1 8. have individuals with weapons. We were gathering up people who had weapons and whatnot, and we were placing them in the back of an LMTV, which is a two and a half ton truck. And then we heard the Apaches open fire. We didn't know what was going on, though. We didn't get any of the radio chatter on the ground. Clear. We were roughly only about three or four blocks away from this courtyard, and uh, we were told to move to that location. Your lead, Brian Lee, should take the next right. That's uh, cruising east down the road. I was dismounted that day, so I was one of the first six soldiers to walk up onto that courtyard. The first thing I saw was a group of men laying by a wall with an RPG laying next to the wall. And to me at the time, the feeling, they didn't look human to me. They looked like something you would see out of a horror movie. It just, it just didn't seem real, I guess. I don't know how to explain it exactly because it was so intense, but at the same time, like my mind was shutting it off. I saw a couple more men laying on the ground and uh, I could hear a child crying. The cry was coming from the van. When I went around to the passenger side of the van, the soldier that I was with, who I had trained with, he was in my squad, he uh, looked inside with me, turned around, started puking and ran away. He didn't want to have anything to do with that part of what he saw inside with the children. What I saw when I looked in was a little girl about three or four years old. Um, she was sitting on the passenger seat. Um, she had a wound to her belly. She had glass in her eyes and in her hair. Um, she had a bunch of little scratches and, and cuts. Next to her, laying half on the floorboard with his head resting on the, the bench seat, was a boy about seven or eight years old. I immediately thought he was dead. He wasn't moving or breathing. Next to him in the driver's seat was who I assumed was the father. When I first pulled the girl out and I had her in my arms cradling her, it's kind of it's kind of weird to explain it, but I almost felt as if I was holding my own child. And the emotions that were rushing through me, it was very emotional for me because my son was born. Um, just prior to this and you know my daughter was close to the same age and um, I kept picturing my own children you know I'm, I'm trying to pick as much glass out of her eyes as I can so that she can close them without cutting her eyes anymore um, trying to get I was running water through her hair trying to wash out the blood and the the glass from her hair too and um, the whole time I'm fighting back tears That's when you can hear in the video 
the medics say, there's nothing else I can do for this girl here. We need to get her evac'd. And uh, so he runs her to the Bradley. I went back outside to take pictures because we were told to take pictures of the scene. And uh, when I looked back in on the van, I saw the boy take like a labored breath. That's when I started screaming out, the boy's alive, the boy's alive. I grabbed him, um, picked him up, told him everything was going to be okay, and started running towards the Bradley. He opened his eyes and looked at me, and uh, I told him it was going to be okay, I have him, don't die, don't die, and his eyes rolled back into his head again. That's when I got up to the Bradley and placed him inside the Bradley with the medics. There was just so much blood on me from him that I didn't think he was going to survive. I didn't know exactly what happened. I think I put it into my head that it was obviously the guys who had the RPGs and the AK-47s that shot up this van. Um, you know, I put myself in denial that us as American troops could do this to innocent children. I had to clean the blood of the children off of my uniform and my IBA, which is your protective vest. And I had a huge flood of emotions just, just barraging me and started piecing it together. And I started realizing that it was the, the Apaches that did that. Things from that day changed for me. I no longer felt that I was doing good in Iraq. It became more along the lines of, I'm just here to make it home to my kids now. There's no point in me being here, so, you know, I just want to make it home. I requested that I go see mental health because I was having a hard time dealing with the, the incidents of that day. Um, he kind of chuckled, you know, like, ha, 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 you know, and he was like, uh, you need to suck it up, quit being a pussy, get the sand out of your vagina. And he's like, I'm just letting you know that if you go, if you go down to mental health, there's going to be repercussions, one of which is being called a malingerer, which if you're getting charged with being a malingerer in the Army, it's a crime. It's basically saying that you're refusing to be a soldier. So not wanting to deal with the repercussions of that on top of being in Iraq, I chose to say Roger that, Sergeant, and tried to do my job from there. There's such a huge stigma in the Army about seeing mental health, especially in the infantry. You know, you're supposed to be so much tougher than everybody else. Because infantry, this is your job. Your job is to kill people. This is your job. But it got to the point when I got home, I had to. I had to do something. I had to talk about it. I had to get a lot of the emotions that I was feeling out. You know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go take care of my well-being because I was destroying my family. And my children were afraid of me. The letter that I, me and Josh wrote to Iraq was very healing to me personally, as well as speaking out about how I felt about the situations, because I had all, all those tensions and all those angers and all those feelings of being used built up inside me that I couldn't speak out about it. So yeah, it's very healing for me to be able to talk about this. You know, I didn't pull the trigger that day. I didn't shoot those children, and I didn't shoot their father or those men on the ground, but I am a part of that system that killed those people. And I think every American is a part of that system. Because every taxpayer pays into this big war machine. And they don't dig deep enough into where their money's going. I think they just sit back and they're like, it's not my problem. 
But if everybody was to stand up and say, this is, this is bullshit, no more. We're not going to do it anymore. We want to know exactly what's going on. Then, you know, it'd make a big difference.